Welcome guys and girls to this DevOps course. If you are someone who is studying for an upcoming cloud DevOps interview, or you simply want to know how different DevOps concepts are put together to create real world pipeline, this course is for you. This course will teach you the basics and set you up to learn more intermediate and advanced concepts. We are going to cover DevOps what and why, DevOps benefits, challenges of DevOps, CI versus CD versus CD, different DevOps pipelines, DevOps learning path, Jenkins, what is it and why we need it, how to set up Jenkins on AWS under free tier, Jenkins console overview, creating our very first Jenkins job, what is Jenkins file and why we need it, and how to build and push container images from Jenkins. For those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Raj, I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. Previously, I was a distinguished cloud architect at Verizon. I'm also a published Udemy and Pluralsight author, public speaker, and author of multiple AWS blogs. If you are new to this channel, please make sure to subscribe. I upload videos on system design and container, DevOps, serverless, interview preparations every week. All right, let's get started. Let's start from the beginning. What is DevOps and why do we need it? In this lecture, we're going to take a look at evolution of modern applications and how does DevOps help there, as well as general practices and benefits of DevOps. Moreover, we are also going to take a look at some challenges of DevOps and how do you solve them. Let's get started. So in the olden days, most applications were running in monolith. So you'll have different APIs coming to the API gateway or load balancer, and everything gets routed to the single large code base. The entry function will check the path and execute the logic accordingly. What was the challenge there? Since Monolith has this single huge code base, the underlying virtual machine or Amazon EC2 for AWS needs to be sizable. In this case, M5.12x large. Even if traffic increases for one of the API or one component for the monolith, there is no way to scale that part. As a result, this huge virtual machine needs to auto scale. And since the traffic only went up for one of the APIs, the utilization of both of these EC2s will be subpar and you will end up paying more. Since everything is integrated into the single code base, it will be very difficult for you to work on a new feature and deliver it without impacting and testing all the other existing features. That's how the applications evolve to microservices. In microservices architecture, each API will have its own separate backend. And depending on the traffic and nature of these APIs, you can choose different virtual machines on the backend when the traffic increases for one component, the backend for that microservice scales up without impacting the backend of other microservices. In addition, since everything is running in a separate microservice, it gets very easier to release new feature. You could even code different microservices in different programming languages. We call this feature polyglot. All right, so microservice is the way to go and the world is moving towards microservice. But what that means is microservices require frequent implementation. If you take a look at some of the large enterprises such as Amazon, Coca-Cola, Netflix, they deploy code every day. In some cases, every 12 seconds. Can traditional deployment keep up with this? Let's take a look. With traditional deployment, you have separate teams for developer operations who is in charge of moving and deploying your code. So in this flow, the developer checks in the code, then waits a little bit for someone to come and build the code, then wait a little bit more to deploy that code to a test environment, wait a little bit more for someone to test that code, you guessed it right, wait even more for the operations team to deploy that code to production. This takes hours or days and a lot of grief for developers and operations. And in case of a production problem, 
the whole cycle is repeated and it takes longer to fix the issues. And in between these hours and days, I'm sure the developer and operation have conversations like this where developer asks, when are you going to deploy my code? And the operation says, when you stop breaking my servers. The developer wants speed, but if you think from the operation perspective, the developer is deploying a gigantic monolith probably after a month of not deploying anything and that could very well break the servers. So at the end of the day, both the developer and the operation folks want to do cool stuff. That's how DevOps was born. The term DevOps is created by Patrick DeBoy in 2009. DevOps is a combination of cultural philosophies, practices and tools that increases an organization's ability to deliver applications and services at high velocity. Evolving and improving products at a faster pace than organizations using traditional software development and infrastructure management processes. Even though I mentioned cultural philosophies, practices and tools, either for good or bad, in the interview, job market is based on tools, so you will be asked more on the tools part. Under a DevOps model, development and operation teams are no longer siloed. Sometimes these two teams are merged into a single team where the engineers work across the entire application lifecycle, from development and test to deployment to operation. So going back to our traditional deployment model, how would this look like in DevOps world? Well, in DevOps world, both the developer and operations will be on the same team that's the cultural part and the technology and the tools part will be all this check-in code, build code, deploy to test, test code, deploy to prod will be automated. There will be minimum number of manual interventions. As a result, whole flow could be done in seconds and in case of errors, it is easy to roll back because even the remediation is automated. You could even automate the monitoring part you can monitor certain critical metrics and in case a metric crosses a threshold, you can trigger a rollback to the previous version of the code. What are some of the general DevOps practices? The first principle is you need to automate everything. Building your code to testing your code, deploying your code and as well as monitoring and auto remediation of your application. You should be deploying frequently rather than one mega deployment in months. You need to codify every step. Your infrastructure, application, testing, error handling, etc. And remember that Rome was not built in a day. This will take time and that's okay. It is not an all or nothing approach. There are organizations where most of the things are done in DevOps but there are still manual steps and that's okay. All right, now that you understand the evolution of modern architecture and how DevOps come into play, let's take a look at some of the DevOps benefits. So let's take a look at some of the DevOps benefits. DevOps has benefits in two different areas, technical and cultural. Under technical benefits, because everything is automated, you can deliver your softwares faster as well as faster problem remediation and it is easier to replicate best practices. What does that mean? In real world, you are not going to have just one environment. You will have sandbox, dev, test, staging and production. Since you automated and codified everything, replicating process is as simple as just copy pasting your pipeline for another environment with the organization best practices built in the pipeline without any human error. Because you are saving time on fix and maintenance, creating new environment, you have more time to innovate and work on business problems. What are some of the cultural benefits? Now the developer operations, and in some cases, testers are in the same team. There is improved communication and collaboration. And this one is a big one greater professional opportunities, developers can learn tools for operations and vice versa and get better job and pay, which leads to happier, more productive teams. So at this point, I would like you to think 
these couple questions for your organizations or project. How long would it take your organization to deploy a change that involves a single line of code? And can you do this on a repeatable, reliable basis? Without DevOps, the answer will be no. Because even to do a single line of code change with traditional deployment, you still have to go through all those long, tedious, and manual processes. With DevOps, since everything is automated, it can be done in seconds. Comparing DevOps and non-DevOps organizations, organizations that implemented DevOps have four times lower change failure rate, 24 times faster recovery times, 200 times more frequent deployments, and 44% more time spent on new features and code. In the last lecture, we learned about benefits of DevOps. Is everything hunky-dory with DevOps? No, there are challenges of DevOps. You might be tested on this in your interview because unless you worked on a real-world DevOps project, you will not be aware of its challenges. All right, let's dive deeper. The biggest challenge of DevOps is Continuously adapting to changing landscape, there are new tools coming out almost every month and there are ever-changing processes and technologies. If I open up the CNCF landscape, the number of tools here are mind-boggling. It is impossible to master all of this. And if I focus specifically on continuous integration and delivery, there are around 50 tools just in this category. And remember, this is just CNCF cloud native. If you go beyond that, the number of DevOps tool available in the market is over 100. Going back to the processes and technologies, if you adopted DevOps few years back, just learning CloudFormation and Jenkins was sufficient. You could have deployed any kind of workload using those two. But now in recent times, multi-cloud is gaining popularity. So you have to learn Terraform in addition to CloudFormation, in Kubernetes, GitOps is getting popular. So now just learning Jenkins is not enough. You need to understand one of the GitOps tool along with Jenkins. The second challenge of DevOps is developers unwilling to provide support. One of the cultural change with DevOps is now the developer and operations are in the same team. And in some cases, they are the same person. And sometimes developers just want to do code. They are not interested in doing support. And another challenge of DevOps is, it takes months or years to ramp up. In certain cases, your organization will already have an established deployment mixed with a lot of manual checking and processes. So for those organizations, you need to have a strategy, such as how to break apart small parts into DevOps parts, and then the migrating the other projects and then modernizing to modern DevOps tool, etc. It could take long time. And whenever it comes to adopting something new, be DevOps or cloud, there are always three main factors, people, process, and technology. So generally process and technology is easier because they are methodical. So sometimes you might face resistance from your organization to change to DevOps because it will change the job functionalities of certain folks. So whenever you talk about challenges, especially in interviews, it is important to note how will you solve them. So how will you solve continuously adapting to changing landscape? So your company needs to establish standard tool sets. You will have a cloud center of excellence or DevOps center of excellence who will go and review audit all these different DevOps tool and based on your security posture and the nature of the project, they will standardize certain sets of tool so that the development teams don't need to waste time and evaluate all these tools themselves. They will also provide templates with best practices built in. For example, if you need to deploy something to Kubernetes, so they will have certain pipelines that is already codified using Jenkins and Argo CD, for an example, with all the security checkpoints built in. So if other teams need to adopt it, they can simply come, copy the template, and then build on top of it, rather than starting from scratch. For developers unwilling to provide support, you need to implement some sort of rotation and give incentives. For the long ramp up time, Utilize vendor training, workshop, 
For example, if your organization is adopting AWS, AWS runs immersion days, workshops, presentations. You get invited to all these conferences that train your workforce and help you adopt DevOps. And the last part, resistance to change. This is a hard problem, so you need to go through cultural training to do that. If you are going for a lead position or a higher management position, look up this cultural training before your interviews. All right, now that we understand what is DevOps, challenges and benefits, let's look into what is CI and what is CD in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to learn about DevOps phases as well as some of the critical terminology in DevOps, CI, CD and CD. I have put CD twice and that's intentional and that will become clear as we go through the lecture. All right, let's get started. So at this point, we understand the high level automated workflow of DevOps, but there are formal phases for this workflow. The first DevOps phase is author, where you, the almighty developer, write code. The next phase is called source, where you check in the source code in some sort of code repository, such as GitHub. The next and one of the most critical phase of DevOps is build, where your code gets compiled and the artifacts gets created as well as unit testing is done. So one example of build could be your code got compiled and a zip file got created if you are creating a Lambda function or your Java code got compiled and a jar file got created, so on, so forth. The next phase is test phase. So in the build phase, you just ran unit testing, but in the test phase, you will run integration testing load testing, UI testing, and penetration testing. And the next phase is deploy, where you deploy the artifacts in your environment. In addition to these formal phases, the other phase is monitoring. In this continuous monitoring phase, you will utilize logs, metrics, and traces to continuously monitor your application. And if an error is detected, the remediation should also be automated. Now that's the ideal end state but it's okay if sometimes you need manual investigation to fix the error. Remediation could be as simple as rolling back to the previous version of the code, which could be automated easily, but if you need deeper investigation and then action, then using the output of this monitoring phase, the appropriate teams can be alerted automatically and then they investigate and fix the issue. Now let's look into the critical terms, CI, CD, and CD. So the first three phases, author, source, and build is known as continuous integration or CI. Now the next terminology, continuous delivery or CD, extends the concept of continuous integration. With continuous delivery, as soon as the developer checks in the code, the code gets built, unit tested, and then goes through integration testing, load testing, API testing, whatever testing is appropriate for your project, and then is ready to be deployed to the environment. Now notice this person with a laptop which says manual approval. So with continuous delivery, you still require a manual approval to deploy your code to production. So the next evolution of CD or continuous delivery is continuous deployment, which is also termed as CD. With continuous deployment, source, build, test, deploy is fully automated without any manual approval. So as soon as the code is checked in, it will get built, tested, and deployed to production. You don't need any human approval. So you might be thinking, what if I have a problem with my code? Won't that get deployed with continuous deployment? Well, that's where rigorous automated testing comes into play. If any of the automated testing fails, either the unit testing fails or integration, load, UI, penetration, testing fails, you can stop the pipeline and send an automated alert to the developer. Also note that during these test phases, you can specify if 90% of the test cases pass, you are okay to deploy. In certain projects, you need 100% of the test cases passed. So keep these two different CDs in mind continuous delivery versus continuous deployment, it is a hot topic in the interviews. Also note that both the CDs extend only up to the deploy phase. 
monitoring phase is out of this CI or CD phase. That's why I have colored it differently than the other five phases. This author source build test and deployed instrumented in an automated fashion, even with the human approval is termed as pipeline or CI CD pipeline. You will have different pipelines for different environments. For example, you could have a separate pipeline for development environment, stage environment and prod environment. One thing to keep in mind as this is not set in stone. You don't need every phase in every environment. For example, for your project, you might determine that unit testing is sufficient for development environment. So you might not have the separate test phase for your dev environment pipeline. In some cases, you might not need to rebuild your code again in the prod environment and you might decide to use the artifact generated from the stage build and use it in the production environment. So there are no hard and fast recommendation here. You need to decide based on your project. All right, now that we understand the DevOps phases, let's take a look at some of the important DevOps tools. There are so many DevOps tools and so many different DevOps topics that it could get a little overwhelming and confusing. You might be thinking exactly what topics you should master to get your DevOps job. In this video, I'm going to go over exactly what skill you need to master to get a DevOps job. I have created and curated this flowchart by going through hundreds of DevOps job, as well as from my practical experience of interviewing for DevOps position both as an interviewee and an interviewer. All right, let's get started. So I have divided the skills into two broad categories, must have and highly recommended. The names are self-explanatory. You have to know the areas that's under must have, technology under highly recommended. It will separate you from other candidates. So the first thing you need to understand is Linux commands. Now don't panic. You don't need to understand the inner working of Linux and what are the intricate differences between different Linux versions. You need to know the commands that can be used with DevOps tools as well as for your day two operations. Next thing you need to master is Git commands. So Git and GitHub specifically is deeply integrated with any DevOps tools in the market. So you need to understand how to check in your code, how to do a pull request, how to resolve version conflict, how to roll back, etc. Next thing you need to know is infrastructure as code. I have given two choices here. For the companies who do most of their work in AWS, they use CloudFormation, so you can master that. Alternatively, you can learn Terraform, which is cloud agnostic. Next topic you need to master is at least one DevOps service. So this is the actual DevOps tool using which you are going to create your DevOps pipeline. I have given three different DevOps tools here. If your project is 100% AWS native, then you should learn AWS provided DevOps tools such as code build, code commit, code pipeline, etc. And then Jenkins and the third one is GitLab. I highly recommend Jenkins. Most of the jobs requires Jenkins as the preferred choice of DevOps tool, it is still the number one tool. Learning Jenkins will open the most amount of job opportunity for your DevOps career. Now the next thing you need to know is DevOps pipelines, as in workflows. Just learning the tools is okay, but you need to understand how you implement different workflows using that tool. For example, how do you build and push Docker container images to a container repository? How do you deploy your container to a Kubernetes cluster? How do you run shell script from Jenkins? How do you submit your infrastructure as code from your DevOps tool? How do you trigger a Lambda from Jenkins? How do you install your software into EC2 using Ansible with Jenkins and much more? Lot of candidates don't do this part and hence they don't understand the pros and cons of different ways to do different workflows. Next, we go into the highly recommended area. So you should master at least one of the relevant technology amongst Kubernetes, Lambda or traditional EC2. So Kubernetes is highly recommended here. 
And finally, you need to bring all your learnings together and do some practice, interview, question and answer. And after you do all that, you should be able to apply for almost all DevOps job and get the job. So let's go over what's covered in this course. So in this course, we are going to go over the Linux commands that you need for your DevOps job. Now Git and GitHub is its own separate area. But in this course, I'm going to go over the essential Git commands that are critical for your DevOps job. Next, I'm going to go over the CloudFormation basics. I have kept the Terraform icon here because I'm going to go over Terraform workflows during DevOps pipeline. Next one, we are going to go over Jenkins in depth. If you complete the Jenkins parts of this course, you should be all set for your interviews as well as your actual projects. Next part is DevOps pipeline. As part of this course, we are going to go over multiple workflows. The workflows I mentioned in the previous slide as well as more. The next area is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is its own huge area on itself. But as part of this course, I'm going to go through Kubernetes Primer. Because we are doing a lot related to Kubernetes with DevOps, such as building an image, pushing it to registry, deploying your application container image to Kubernetes cluster, etc. That's why I wanted to go through the basic lectures so that you have some sort of foundation to understand those lectures as well as go forward and learn more of Kubernetes. Next, I'm going to go over the DevOps interview question and answer. I know, I know what you folks are thinking right now. Raj, how about certifications and coding? You did not mention them in your flowchart. So thing about certifications is Certs are good only to get recruiter attention. Once you go to the interview, no one cares about the cert. You will be asked questions on the topics that I went through in the flowchart. If you do want to get a cert to distinguish yourself from the other candidates, go for AWS Sysadmin Associate or AWS DevOps Pro. You can also get Kubernetes certs. They are quite valuable at this point. Avoid super specific certs, especially if you are beginning your career in DevOps. Super specific certs like Terraform certs are not that valuable and it has less bang for your buck. In most of the job applications, you would see that it is nice to have the DevOps certification or Kubernetes certification. In very rare occasions, you would see someone asking for super specific certifications like Terraform, Ansible, now about coding, coding is not a primary requirement for DevOps jobs. It can be picked up at job and more importantly, there are no coding round for DevOps interviews. That's why I did not put it under must have or highly recommended. It is kind of nice to have. If you want, you can learn one of the coding language and then run some DevOps scripts in it so that when the interviewer asks, Hey, can you tell me how you automated some of your processes? So you can say in addition to using Jenkins and bash scripts and infrastructure as code, you could say that you have also used some sort of coding to run some scripts. And if you do want to learn some coding, learn Python. Python is very diverse and can be used in different areas. For example, for DevOps, you can use Python to run some scripts. You can use Python to code backend of the APIs. Python can be used to write AI ML programs. And recently, Python even started to get used in the front end applications. Just for the record, I know Python quite well, but I learned it because I was in the project related to AI ML. When I was giving interview for cloud architecture, as well as DevOps, no one asked any questions on Python. All right, back to the flowchart. Hopefully this flowchart was helpful to reduce the confusion on your mind that what DevOps topics you should study and practice. That's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next lecture. Bye. All right. Finally, it's time to talk about the superstar of DevOps, Jenkins. In this lecture, we are going to learn what is Jenkins and why is it so popular? At this point, we understand the different phases of DevOps as well as what is CI and what is CD. 
But remember, DevOps has been around for more than 10 years and it is a multi-billion dollar market with year-over-year -year growth of double-digit percentage. So it's normal that a lot of big companies want to capture this market. Jenkins is one of the automation tool for this, but that's not the only one. There are over 100 DevOps tools, including some of the tools from big companies. And after many years of fierce battle, Jenkins is the winner. According to a recent DevOps survey, 64% of all DevOps pipelines run on Jenkins. The next software is TeamCity, where only 8% of the DevOps pipelines run there, then CircleCI, and then the rest of the tools divide the remaining percentages. So the main question is, why Jenkins? Why is it so popular? So Jenkins is an open source CI-CD tool for DevOps. It started in 2004. The main superpower of Jenkins is, it has the package flexibility. You can install and run Jenkins in your local machine, on-prem, EC2, Docker, Fargate, Kubernetes, and more and it is cloud agnostic, doesn't matter which cloud you use, you can always use Jenkins to instrument your CI-CD pipeline. The other superpower of Jenkins is it has superior integration with numerous tools for all DevOps phases. As you could see, there is a lot of components for each of these DevOps phases, such as compiling code, saving artifacts, unit testing, integration testing, deploying, etc. And it is impossible to have one tool fits all. But the superpower of Jenkins is whatever tools you use for compiling your code, testing your code, even doing security analysis, Jenkins integrates with almost all of them. The next reason Jenkins is so popular is because of its vibrant community. Remember that Jenkins is open source. So they are not even charging money for you to run it like some other DevOps tools. Jenkins has over 1800 plus plugins. You can even contribute your own plugins to the ecosystem. Or if you want, your company can write its own private plugins. Jenkins supports all that. Since it has been around from 2004, and it runs on any infrastructure, it is very easy to find quick starts, workshops, and example. And if you face any issues while deploying these Jenkins quick starts or real world applications, you get extensive question answers that's already out there, as well as documentation. If your enterprise does not want the open source Jenkins and want some sort of enterprise support, as well as some security checks and balances, that's fine as well. There are other third-party companies that build DevOps offerings on top of Jenkins. One big example of this is CloudBees. And last but not the least, Jenkins is constantly evolving and progressing with technology. When Jenkins came out, it could only run on virtual machines. But today, it kept up with all the container development. You can run Jenkins not only on Kubernetes, but on Fargate as well. So keep these reasons in mind in the interview. If the interviewer asks you, what is Jenkins? Explain that Jenkins is an open source CI-CD tool for doing all the DevOps phases, but also explain some of the superpowers of Jenkins. Now let's take a look at Jenkins and DevOps job market. Why should you learn Jenkins? The average salary, if you know Jenkins, in USA is $97,000 per year, and in India, 6.1 lakh per year. Note that this is just to know Jenkins. If you understand Jenkins, and then some of the cloud components, your salary goes up even more. The second reason Jenkins is so popular and why you should learn Jenkins is, most DevOps job requires Jenkins. So if I look at LinkedIn jobs, there are over 60,000 jobs in United States that requires Jenkins. Similarly, in India, there is around 17,000 jobs that require Jenkins. So if you made the decision to learn Jenkins, you made 
the right choice. All right, folks, let's dive deeper into Jenkins. That's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next lecture. Welcome guys and girls to another Jenkins installation video. In the last video, we learned how to install Jenkins in your local desktop, but in real world projects, Jenkins will be running on some cloud such as AWS. In this video, we are going to learn how you can install Jenkins on AWS, specifically Amazon EC2s. For all the demos throughout this course, I am actually going to use Jenkins running on AWS because that's what you are gonna see on your real world projects. If you want to follow along, you should have a AWS account. You can use T2 Micro under free tier to do the demos with me. All right, so I'm going to use the official Jenkins on AWS installation instructions. In the documentation, it talks about creating a key pair and then later on, it is going to use that key pair with a putty to SSH into the instance. We are going to use the modern way of SSHing into EC2. We don't need any key pair, we will use SSM. So I'm going to skip this step entirely. I'm also going to skip this create a security group part and I'm going to come directly to the launch an Amazon EC2 instance. This one, I'm just going to follow whatever it said. So I'm in my AWS console. To create a new instance, click launch instances. I'm going to give the name Jenkins on EC2. And by default, Amazon Linux 2 AMI will be selected and this is free tier eligible. So I'm going to keep that selected, keep everything as is, instance type T2 micro, which will again be free tier eligible. If I scroll down, by default, it will allow SSH traffic from anywhere. That's fine for this demo. Under configure storage, instead of eight, I'm just going to give 16 gigabyte and free tier customers can get up to 30 gigabyte. So we should also be under free tier. All right, click launch instance. Successfully initiated launch of instance. It's gonna give you a ID. So click that link. It is going to take us to the EC2 console and the instance state is pending. It's going to go through all the startup phases and it will come to running. So I'm going to pause the video and come back when our EC2 is up and running. And I have opened up the installation instruction along with our AWS console side by side. So the installation instruction is on the right. Uh, so we just launched the Amazon EC2 instance. So I'm going to scroll down. So we did all that. So now we are going to SSH into the instance and install Jenkins. We are not going to use PuTTY. PuTTY is the old approach and quite painful. What we're going to do is select the EC2 that we just provisioned and click this connect button in the AWS console. It is going to take you to EC2 instance connect with the default username EC2-user. Click connect. All right, so we are SSH'd in to our EC2 instance. On the right, I'm going to scroll down so first we need to run sudo yum update. So I'm going to copy that and paste it over here. And then we're going to run this wget command to get the Jenkins package. Okay, then copy this command and run this. Then run sudo yum upgrade. So basically just copy paste the commands pretty straightforward. Press yes. All right, now let's install Java. All right, Java is installed. Now let's install Jenkins. Copy this, press this. All right, Jenkins installation is complete. Then we are going to enable the Jenkins service to start at the boot in case you stop the IC2 instance and start it again. All right, then start Jenkins as a service. All right, Jenkins is started and you can check the status of the Jenkins service by running this command. All right, so as you could see, the Jenkins service is active running. So now Jenkins is installed and running. So we're going to go back to our EC2 console, select the EC2 that we just provisioned and then copy this public IP for address. So I'm going to click this icon to copy it, open up a new tab, paste the IP address. And this part is important. You have to put colon 8080. 
So press enter. And this will fail not to panic. It, this is because we need to update our security group. So go back to the EC2, go to security. Here's the security group, click this. All right, so in the security group, only thing that's allowed now is SSH. So we have to add HTTP connection as well as custom TCP port 8080. So click edit inbound rules and don't change anything that's there. Click add rule and here select HTTP and you can select CIDR block as the internet as in 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. Click add rule again and then select custom TCP and give the port as 8080 and the source give the whole internet. Uh, so in real world project, your administrator will set this up. Your administrator will limit this to the CIDR IP address range of your company network. But for this demo, this is fine. Click save rules. All right, so now the security group has SSH access, regular HTTP access, as well as custom TCP port 8080 access. So let's go back to our EC2, copy the public IP address, open another tab, give 8080, press enter. There we go, unlock Jenkins. So now we need to get the password uh, from the EC2 Jenkins installation. So I'm going to resize this again. So go under configure Jenkins, scroll down, copy this command, and then uh, go back to EC2, and then if you have the SSM session open, that's fine. Else, uh, select the EC2, click connect again. Click connect. All right, now paste the command. So this is the password. Copy this whole thing. Go back to the Jenkins. Give the administrator password. Click continue. Don't save this. All right, we get the customized Jenkins screen. By default, install suggested plugins will be selected. So keep that as is and then click on that. All right, so now this is going to install some of the default plugin and open up the Jenkins console. All right, so now you need to create your first admin user. You can give your name, so I'm just going to give my name, give any password, confirm the password. Also give a proper email address because if you lose your password, you will need to use this email address uh, to restore your password. Uh, all right, then click save and continue on the bottom right. This is the Jenkins URL. You don't need to uh, keep this copy pasted. The way I do it, I go back to the EC2 console, select the EC2 where my Jenkins is running, copy this, and again, paste the IP colon 8080. Um, you have to give this 8080 because the web server that's running Jenkins is running in the 8080 port. If you skip that, it's not going to work. Anyway, go back to setup, click save and finish. That's it. Our Jenkins is up and running on EC2. Click start using Jenkins. All right, folks, join me in the next video where we go over the Jenkins console. All right, so our Jenkins is up and running on EC2. In this video, let's go over a brief overview of the Jenkins console. All right, so uh, on the bottom right of the screen, you have the Jenkins version. All the good stuff is on the left. So to create a job, you will use new item and to manage your Jenkins install plugins, you are going to select manage Jenkins. So if you select manage Jenkins, it is going to open up this view with system configuration, security, status, uh, etc. So the way I navigate this is, I actually hover my mouse over this dashboard and then click this down arrow and here it shows the same option but it makes it easier. So you could see if you hover your mouse to manage Jenkins, all the options come in and you can simply select the one you want to go. And we're going to go over these options on individual lectures as we go through different uh, demos and different use cases. So let's learn about this configure system one real quick. So just for fun, let's select configure system and this shows all the Jenkins information will be saved in slash var slash lib slash Jenkins on the EC2. 
if you have installed Jenkins in local, you can go there as well. It's gonna show you a local directory. Uh, system message is just a message which is gonna show in your uh, Jenkins screen. For example, let's say you put, I will learn Jenkins and get better paying job and click save. And you can see on your uh, Jenkins console, it will show the message. Don't use this create job option because the one you want to use is new item on the left, either from here or on the dashboard new item. Why you should not use anything here? Real quick, so I'm going to open up a Jenkins where I have a bunch of stuff already done. This is the screen you're probably going to see most of the time. Uh, so the new item here is kind of gone. Only way you can create new item is from the left. And here you can create different views. So you can click this plus icon and it is going to open up this list view or my view. So my view is default. You can click list view, click OK. And then you can select what jobs you want to see, what columns in the job you want to see. So it's up to you. Most of the times your administrator will set this up for you for the whole team. And going back to the initial screen, it kind of shows what jobs I ran, what jobs ended successfully, marked by the green check mark, and what jobs failed, marked by the red X icon. And the jobs which has just three dots and neither a green check mark or a red X means I have created the jobs, but I have not submitted them. All right, let's go ahead and build our very first Jenkins job. All right, let's create our very first Jenkins job. To create a job, click this new item on the top left, give a name of the job. I'm going to give the name very first Jenkins job select freestyle project, scroll down, click OK. So there are a lot of sections in a Jenkins job and we're going to go through all of it as we go through the course. For now, scroll down to this build step. So this build is the heart of Jenkins job. It tells Jenkins what to do. Click this arrow and you have multiple options here. Execute Windows batch command, execute shell and Gradle, etc. Select execute shell. And here you can give any shell command. So if you think about it, anything at the end of the day could be a shell command. You want to install some external library, you could run a shell command to do that. You want to compile your Java program, you can run a shell command to do that. You want to zip something, you could run a shell command to do that. You can even run Kubernetes command, which at the end of the day is a shell command to install something on Kubernetes. But more on that fancy stuff later on, let's just start with hello world. So I'm just going to type echo hello world from Jenkins. Scroll down, click save. At this point, the job is created, but it has not built. To run the job or build the job, click build now. And that will run the job and the job runs will come under build history. Every time you run a job, a new version number will come in. So if I run build now again, you should see number two. How do you see the outputs from the job? You can simply click this pound one and then go to console output. And here it says the command it executed is echo hello world from Jenkins. And the output is hello world from Jenkins and the job finished successfully. Alternatively, from this screen, you can select this down arrow and directly select console output. And you can also delete this build, edit, all that stuff. You can click go back to the project. If you want to edit the job, click configure, scroll down, and we can edit the jobs, click save. And if you click build now, version three will appear with our newly typed message. So if I click this icon, click console output, here you go. Hello world from Jenkins, DevOps rocks. All right, first Jenkins job in the books. That's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next lecture. Bye. Jenkins file is an important concept in Jenkins, both for real world projects and in interviews. In this lecture, we are going to learn what is it and why do we need Jenkins file? So let's say at this point, you have mastered the Jenkins console with plugins. 
If you need to create a job, you know how to search for the plugin, you install the plugin and new options appear in the Jenkins job console. You can select it appropriately and your job is done. But what if you need to create the same job in all your environments? Also, what if you need to change some of these jobs down the line? So not only you have to manually create the similar jobs in staging, production, UAT, it's also tedious to go in the console and then change what the job does down the line. So you are not happy at that part. That's a lot of manual work. That's why Jenkins file was born. Instead of you selecting options in the Jenkins console, you codify what your Jenkins job supposed to do. You can think of this as pipeline as code. This file is named as Jenkins file. When the Jenkins job is submitted, it simply grabs the Jenkins file from your GitHub repository and then runs. So to replicate this Jenkins job, you can either copy this Jenkins file in this repo and just push it to the different repo for staging and production, or you can point it to the same Jenkins file. So this is much more efficient. So let's go over the advantages. So Jenkins file is pipeline as code for Jenkins job. This is very similar to infrastructure as code. Uh, so instead of you provisioning infrastructure in console, you use Terraform or CloudFormation, which tells the cloud provider what infrastructure to provision. So Jenkins file is exactly like that. You tell when to run, what plugin to use and how to run. And since at the end of the day, this is a codified file, you can review this like a code. So it makes it very easier to review your job. You can code this Jenkins file directly into the Jenkins job, but the best practice is to keep it in the Git repository. So you can version control this Jenkins file and roll back if something goes wrong. You can audit trail who changed what and it becomes the single source of truth for the pipeline. And in case you are replicating the same Jenkins jobs in multiple environment, it reduces the human error because you are simply copying over the Jenkins file. That's why Jenkins file is so important. All right, folks, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next lecture. At this point, we went through all the theory of Jenkins jobs and Jenkins file. Time to put all that theory into action. In this lecture, we are going to build a Docker container image and push that image to a container repository, such as Docker Hub. All right, let's get started. Before we jump into Jenkins, it is very important to understand the high level flow of Docker build and push. So when you, the almighty developer, push your application code along with a Docker file in your GitHub repository, you need to first build the Docker container image by running this Docker file. And you run this by running the command docker build. Once docker build finishes, it creates the container image in the agent. So if you are running this command in a EC2, it's gonna create that container image within that EC2. At this point, you need to push this container image to a container repository such as Docker Hub. You do that by running the command docker push. And when you do that, your container image moves to the container image repository, and from there it can be deployed to a Kubernetes cluster. Now this docker push command is not just really docker push, because you need to log in to your container repository. So under the hood, you need to run docker login to log in to your Docker Hub account, then docker push to push the container image, and then docker logout to log out from your repository. So that's what we are going to do with the Jenkins job. Let's jump into the Jenkins console and my GitHub repository to understand. Under the DevOps course repository, you will see this folder, push docker image. Click this and then we have all the necessary artifacts. This real world project is useful in understanding not just how to build and push container image, but also how to work with a sub folder in your repository. Till this point, everything was under the main branch, under the main root folder, DevOps course, but in this case, we have a subfolder. So let's go over the application program and the Docker file and Jenkins file. 
The application program is super straightforward. It's importing the Flask library and then just returning DevOps rocks. The external dependencies are listed in requirements.txt. So whatever I put in requirements.txt needs to be installed within the Docker container image. So in this case, I'm installing Flask version 1.1.1. All right, now let's take a look at the Docker file. The Docker file is grabbing the standard image of Python 3.8 Slim Buster, creating a slash app work directory, copying over the requirements.txt, and then running pip install to grab that requirements.txt packages, in this case, Flask, and then copying everything and then starting the container. Now let's go over the important part, the Jenkins file. To log in to Docker Hub, we need the Docker Hub credentials. The credentials are stored under Docker Hub ID in Jenkins credentials. So in this case, I'm defining an environment section and I'm saving the Docker Hub user ID and password in this Docker Hub underscore creds environment variable. Note that as soon as you do that, Jenkins is going to save the user ID inside Docker Hub underscore creds underscore USR or user and the password with Docker Hub underscore creds underscore PSW. You don't need to define these two variables separately. Then we have few stages. First, we want to clone the repository. So this part we already know. So we are just going to do checkout SCM. When you set up your Jenkins job, you have to point the SCM to the GitHub repository. And whenever you do checkout SCM, it's going to clone that repository to the Jenkins agent. Alternatively, you can also give the URL of the repository here. It does the same thing. And we are going to see that as an example in the other reusable projects. And then I'm just running the ls asterisk command to show that everything is copied over. And then I'm building the image. So this is where we need to run docker build command. So we are running sh and then docker build and dash t is tagging the image. Uh, so there are two ways to do this. So the commented line shows if you want to use the tag latest, uh, then you don't need to put this colon build number. Uh, but then using latest is not the best practice because you will keep overwriting the image. Uh, and if you do that by mistake, uh, your production workload can suffer. Uh, so the best practice to use a unique tag. So every time this job runs, this build underscore number is a standard Jenkins provided environment variable. You do not need to define it in environment section. Uh, so it is going to tag the image with my Docker Hub user ID and the repository and then the build number. And this is another important part. You have to specify where is the Docker file. In our case, the Docker file is not under root. It is under the folder push Docker image. So you have to give dot slash push Docker image from slash. And then you have to do Docker logging. There are two ways to do that. Uh, you can do sh Docker logging, then the user ID as the Docker hub creds underscore user password, Docker Hub creates password, which is a straightforward way. But the problem with this is uh, in certain cases, this will leave the password visible in the console output and the logs of the jobs, which you don't want to do. The best practice is to do it this way. You echo this uh, Docker Hub creates password, but it's actually is not going to show in the console output. Uh, it is going to grab that password and put it in password dash stdin. And then you run the Docker login command with the user ID and then the password that it captured from the echo. And then comes the Docker push command. If you have used latest, you don't need to put the build number. Uh, I commented this again because this is not the best practice. You can simply run Docker push and then the Docker hub uh, user ID and the repository. Uh, but instead we want to use a specific tag. So we are running Docker push, uh, user ID, repository and then the tag. And once everything is done, you, it is the best practice to do logout. So I'm running sh docker logout. One thing to keep in mind that uh, let's say your Jenkins job fails uh, in this stage. Uh, so basically the build image is successful, uh, but it fails in the login. You cannot restart from this stage. Why? Because the docker push is using the build number. Uh, if you restart the job, 
it is going to get a new build number and it will try to push something that doesn't exist. So for this job, if something fails, uh, you have to fix it and then restart from the top. All right, so now let's jump into the Jenkins and then do this in action. This job does require you to install Docker on your Jenkins agent as well as a couple of plugins. If you have followed all the videos in the setup section, you are all set. If not, take a look at the readme file in this folder and then follow those before you try running this job. So now let's jump into the Jenkins console and create our job. All right, let's click new item. I'm going to name this job as build push image 01. You can give any name, select pipeline, click OK. Scroll down. Now pipeline script is coming from our GitHub repository. So give pipeline script from SCM. Under SCM, select Git. And here you have to give the repository URL. So I'm going to go back to my repository and then DevOps course and then code, copy the HTTPS, go back to Jenkins, paste the repository. Uh, this is a private repository. So you do have to give the credential. Okay, here we go. The branch specifier, the main branch is named main. And here is the important part. The script path points to the Jenkins file. In our case, the Jenkins file for this project is inside this push Docker image. Uh, so you have to give the path here. So instead of just keeping it here, you have to give push Docker image. So basically name of the subfolder and then slash Jenkins file, click save. And let me show you my Docker Hub. In Docker Hub, Raj AT Docker ID is my user ID and then slash the name of the repository. So Jenkins test, if I go inside, uh, it's empty. Uh, all right, so now let's go back to the Jenkins job and click build now. All right, everything ran successfully. Let's check out the output. I'm going to go to the console output. It cloned the repository on the first stage, and then it's running the ls command. So it's showing all the files, the subfolder, files inside the subfolder, and then docker build. So it's building the docker, and you would see the build number is one because this is the first time I submitted this job. And then it's doing the Docker logging. Login succeeded. And then we are pushing the Docker container image. It's showing all the layers of the Docker image. All right, it's pushed everything. Then it's running Docker logout, so success. So let's go to our Docker Hub and refresh this page. All right, our new container image is here and ready to be deployed. Uh, now, again, this section is meant to be reusable parts. So I'm not going to show how to grab this container image and put it in a Kubernetes deployment file yet. That's covered under a real world project use case in another chapter. All right, folks, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next lecture. Hi folks, Raj here. So this video is the first one hour covering the basics from my full DevOps with Jenkins, Kubernetes and Ansible course. The full course is over eight and a half hours long it covers topics from basics to intermediate to advanced. It comes with a certificate of completion as well as 30 day money back guarantee. If you don't like the course, you get your money back, no questions asked. The full course is divided into four main areas, DevOps fundamentals, DevOps prerequisites, Jenkins and DevOps interview guide. Under DevOps fundamentals, you learn the topics that's needed to create the foundation of DevOps before we go and implement different real world workflows. Then we cover DevOps prerequisites. We cover Git and GitHub basics, infrastructure as code basics, Linux basics, and Kubernetes primer. All these prerequisites are essential for real world DevOps and all this is included in the course without any additional cost. Then we dive into Jenkins. We start from basic concepts to moderate to advanced. Then we use those concepts to implement real world workflows such as doing unit testing using Docker, building and creating Docker container images and push to registry, running CloudFormation and Terraform from Jenkins, deploying to Kubernetes, running Ansible and more. Then we tie everything together by going over basic, intermediate and advanced interview guide. 
I have included a $9.99 Udemy discount coupon for this newly released DevOps course in the description. Also, in the spirit of learning, I have created $9.99 discount coupon for all of my courses, so check them out in the description if interested. As always, thanks for watching this video. If you found this video helpful, please click subscribe, ask me any questions in the comment section, and share this channel with your friends and family. Alright, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video.